In this video we're going to look at how we can use polar coordinates to describe points in a plane and how we can produce graphs of functions given in terms of their polar coordinates. So starting with a plane if we're going to have polar coordinates we first of all need a point called the origin or the pole and a line or a direction starting at the origin or pole which is called the initial line. The polar coordinates of a point P on the plane are given in square brackets rather than round brackets and are a distance R and an angle theta where R is the distance of the point P from the pole and fairly obviously because R is a distance it only makes sense to insist that R is greater than or equal to zero. And then theta is the anti-clockwise angle at the pole from the initial line to the line OP. And by convention, theta is measured in radians with either theta lying between 0 and 2 pi or theta lying between minus pi and pi. Now all of this may well seem rather familiar because polar coordinates are really very much the same idea as the modulus argument form of a complex number. So if we using polar coordinates instead of having the normal Cartesian grid we've got a grid formed by circles and for instance the point that I've just marked there is 11 units away from the origin at an angle of 5 pi by 12 from the initial line so its polar coordinates are 11 5 pi by 12 and then the point that I've just marked there is 1, 2, 3, 4 units away from the origin and at an angle of 17 pi by 12. So the point Q has got polar coordinates of 4, 17 pi by 12 if we're saying that polar coordinates need to have an angle between 0 and 2 pi. Alternatively if we're having polar coordinates between pi and minus pi this one would be um, 4 minus 7 pi by 12 would be the angle we'd need to go back clockwise to get to Q. So if I want to find the polar coordinates of the point A with coordinates minus 5, 11, quick sketch is a good idea. Okay so R is just the distance OA so that is going to be by Pythagoras square root of minus 5 squared plus 11 squared so that's going to be the square root of 146 and then the angle that we require is the angle theta there it's much easier to work out the acute angle first of all so if we're looking at the acute angle that we've got alpha then we've got a distance of 5 in the x direction we've got a distance of 11 in the y direction so we've got tan alpha is 11 over 5 so alpha is 1.14 radians remember we need to be using radians so theta is pi minus alpha which is 1.997 radians so the polar coordinates of this point A are root of 146 1.997 now remember 
that we have met before the idea of the definition of cosine and sine that if we have a circle with center the origin and radius 1 and we draw an angle, a line out making an angle theta with the x-axis then the point where our line going out starting from the origin and meeting the point P meets the circle is the, the point P where X is defined to be the cosine of theta and sine theta is defined as being the Y coordinate of P. So if I start off with a point P which has got polar coordinates R theta then I know that the point P lies on a circle of radius R and center the origin we know that the angle theta is the angle from the initial direction or the x-axis round to the line joining the origin to P. If we superimpose onto this diagram a circle of radius 1, then we know that the ray OP is going to meet the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1 at the point Q with coordinates cos theta sine theta. and an enlargement of scale factor r and center the origin will take the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1 onto the circle x squared plus y squared equals r squared and will also transform the point q onto the point p so that means that we now know that the point p has got coordinates r cos theta r sine theta So this tells me that the point P with polar coordinates R theta has got Cartesian coordinates R cos theta, R sine theta. So if I need to find the Cartesian coordinates of the point B whose polar coordinates are 4, 5.18 then just remembering the result that we've just introduced we've got the point B is going to have Cartesian coordinates 4 cos 5.18, 4 sine 5.18, in other words 1.803 minus 3.571. So we've seen that if the point P has polar coordinates R theta then the Cartesian coordinates of P are x, y, where x is R cos theta, y is R sine theta. So immediate consequences of these two results are, first of all, x squared plus y squared is R squared cos squared theta plus R squared sine squared theta, which is just R squared times by cos squared theta plus sine squared theta but cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is 1 so we've got x squared plus y squared equals r squared in other words r is the square root of x squared plus y squared that shouldn't surprise us because r is simply the distance of the point p from the origin we've also got y over x is going to be equal to r sine theta divided by r cos theta which is going to give me tan theta so I've got y over x is going to equal tan theta so if we've got a point P has Cartesian coordinates x y and polar coordinates r theta we have four results we've got we know that x is r cos theta y is r sine theta so y is r sine theta and r is the square root of x squared plus y squared and we've also seen that tan theta is y over x 
The first three of these results are really useful for moving between polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates and vice versa. The fourth one is less useful and really does need to be used with exceptional care. And the problem is with it is the fact that tan theta equals y over x does not mean that theta is tan to the minus 1 of y over x. And that's the pitfall that many people fall into if they try and use that relationship. So try and concentrate on using the first three of those four relationships. Now we're going to have a look at how we can use polar coordinates to produce polar graphs. And polar graphs are usually given in the form r equals a function of theta. So let's have a look at how we might draw the curve, which for reasons that will become apparent in a minute or two, is known as a cardioid, whose polar equation is r equals 1 plus cos theta. There's lots of ways we could tackle this. We could produce a table to, produce, to plot the graph. We could use GeoGebra to help us plot the graph. Or eventually, and this is what we're going to be aiming at in the next few slides, is to produce sufficient experience where we can produce a sketch and simple paper, pencil and a little brain bit of brain power to produce the sketch. But let's start by trying to produce a table to plot the graph. OK, so if I've got r equals 1 plus sine theta, then here are my axes that I'm going to use with the polar um, grid imposed on them. If r equals, uh, if theta equals naught, r is 1 plus sine naught, which is 1. That gives me the point I've plotted there. If theta equals pi by 6, sine of pi by 6 is 0 0.5. So I've got um, the point 1.5 pi by 6 to plot. If theta is pi by 3, sine theta is root 3 over 2, which is somewhere around about 0.87. So r is going to be about 1.87. So we've got the point 1.87 pi by 3. If theta is pi by 2, sine pi by 2 is 1. So r is going to be 1 plus 1, which is 2. So I'm going to have the point 2 pi by 2, which is plotted there. And carrying on in a similar fashion, we can put in the remaining points. OK, so we've got all of the points there, and having plotted all of those different points, we can now see that the graph is doing something like that. And what we've got there is an inverted heart shape. And the cardioid, um, if you think of cardiac arrest, it relates to heart. OK, so we've sketched there our first polar graph simply by using table of results and then plotting the points onto a polar grid. If I use GeoGebra to produce the graph, I just get the, exactly the same graph. It's just drawn a little bit neater and it hasn't got the wobbles that I had trying to draw the graph freehand. Right, so there's our card. There is our polar graph of r equals 1 plus sine theta. What's the Cartesian equation of this graph? OK, so can we get a graph, the equation of this graph in terms of x-coordinates and y-coordinates? Well, if we're going to try to get the Cartesian equation, we need to use the three results 
that we know that x is r cos theta, we know r, y is r sine theta, and we know that r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So, using these three results, looking at the equation that I've got here as well, r equals 1 plus sine theta, the first thing I can say is that sine theta is certainly equal to y divided by r. So that means that I can now rewrite the polar graph as r equals 1 plus y over r. Multiplying up by r, I get r squared equals r plus y. But I know that r, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So I've now got on the left hand side x squared plus y squared is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus y. So I've now arrived at a, an equation linking the x coordinates and the y coordinates of all points on our polar graph. It is possible in this case to get rid of the square root as well. If I move the y across, so if I subtract y from each side first of all, and then square each side, I get the possibly more elegant equation. x squared plus y squared take away y, all squared, is equal to x squared plus y squared. So, let's have another look. We'll now have a look at the curve whose polar equation is r equals 1 plus 2 sine theta. So, we'll start off doing exactly what we did before. We'll produce a table. We've got the option of GeoGebra, or we, we're trying to build up to the point where we've got sufficient experience to be able to sketch these graphs without being reliant on a table or GeoGebra. So there's our table again. So when theta equals naught, r is 1 plus 2 times naught, which is 1. And going through, we've got all of those different values going through very quickly. So if I start trying to plot the points, I'll get those points and that curve. Now the important thing to notice here is that when theta is 4 pi by 3, the value of r is negative. And we have said that a negative value of r doesn't make any sense at all. So there is no point plotted when theta equals 4 pi by 3. Similarly, r is negative when theta equals 3 pi by 2 and when theta equals 5 pi by 3. So we've got no points plotted for those values. Now, if we move to GeoGebra in this case, you'll see that GeoGebra seems to have introduced a new loop. And this new loop has said that when theta equals 4 pi by 3, I'm getting a negative value of r, so I'm going to plot that on theta equals 2 pi by 3, so the other side of the pole. Now this is a little bit strange because we've just said earlier on it makes no sense to have values of r which are negative. And fortunately WJEC, and as far as I'm concerned, common sense says that we reject values where r is negative. Okay. However, GeoGebra in this case, if we just use GeoGebra as it stands, gives us that un unwanted bit of the curve, which is a bit of a nuisance. However, we have prepared a app for GeoGebra which will only plot the polar functions for values of theta for which r is greater than or equal to zero. And this gives us a good output 
from the for the function or for the graph r equals 1 plus 2 sine theta. This GeoGebra app, your teacher may well have access to this app and be able to supply it to you if you are in the habit of using GeoGebra. We've used this app in subsequent slides within this video and indeed on the next video about polar coordinates. So what about drawing the graph whose polar equation is r equals 1 plus 2 cos theta? You can produce a table to plot the graph. So going through producing the table we get that. So we're going to be rejecting the values where r becomes negative. So plotting the points will give me this, this first point going round. Um, when theta equals 2 pi by 3, we come down to 0. When theta is 5 pi by 6, there's no value. When theta is pi, there's no value. When theta is 7 pi by 6, there's no value. When theta equals three, um, 4 pi by 3, we're at 0. And when theta equals 3 pi by 2, we're at 1. And then 5 pi by 3 we're at 2, and then we're at 2.7. So the graph is looking something like that from our table of values. And if we look at the graph on the GeoGebra app, we get just a rather improved version of the same graph. As I say, if you are using GeoGebra, then your teacher should have access to a copy of this app so that you can investigate your polar graphs using um, this app, which will make sure you don't get the extra bits for negative values of R coming in. Right, let's have a look at a few polar graphs now. So R equals 1 plus cos theta r equals 1 plus cos theta plus cos squared theta r equals 2 plus cos theta over 1 plus cos squared theta now all of these graphs are basically graphs of the form r equals a function of cos theta where f is either a polynomial or a rational function and notice that all of these graphs have got the initial line, or if you like, the x-axis, as a line of symmetry. If, on the other hand, we start looking at the graph of r equals 1 plus sine theta plus 2 sine squared theta, or the graph of y, uh, um, r equals 4 minus sine theta over 3 plus sine cube theta. We'll notice in this case that we've got a line of symmetry, which is the line theta equals pi by 2 plus or minus pi by 2. Or in other words, if you like, the y-axis is acting as a line of symmetry. So if we've got r equals f of sine theta, where f is a polynomial or rational function, then the polar graph will be symmetric about the y-axis. Now, let's carry on our thinks about, uh, thinking about graphs. If we've got the graph of r equals 1 plus 2 cos theta, we've got r equals naught at theta equals 2 pi by 3 and 4 pi by 3. Now what I've got drawn there is the graph that we've already seen earlier on of r equals 1 plus 2 cos theta but we've, I've also drawn in the two rays consisting of theta equals 2 pi by 3 and theta equals 4 pi by 3. And if I zoom in to the pole and look carefully at what's happening, you can see that those two lines, or the rays, 
theta equals 2 pi by 3 and theta equals 4 pi by 3 are actually tangential to the curve at the pole. So, this suggests an important result. And this important result is that if we have a polar curve of the form r equals f of theta, and if r is naught when theta equals alpha, then the ray, that's the half line, theta equals alpha, is going to be a tangent to the curve at the pole. Now this is an important result that we're going to use in terms of sketching the graphs of polar, gra polar curves. We'll prove that this is correct in the next PowerPoint and video. So, to sketch the polar graph of r equals f of theta, I'm going to try and have a sketching process now. It's a really good idea to find the maximum possible value of r if it exists. It's also a good idea to find the minimum possible value of r. And if that minimum possible value of r is less than zero, then that's going to tell us that there are going to be values of theta for which r does not exist because we know that r has to be greater than or equal to zero. If this second condition is the case, if the minimum possible value of r is less than zero, then solve the equation r equals naught. And if r, e uh, if r equals naught when theta equals alpha, then the ray theta equals alpha must be a tangent to the curve at the pole. It's well worth your while just quickly doing calculations of what is the value of r when theta equals naught, theta equals pi by 2, theta equals pi, and theta equals 3 pi by 2. Nice easy values which give you four points to work with. And then finally, we've got the two symmetry conditions. If r is a polynomial or rational function of cos theta, then the graph is going to be symmetric about the initial line, that is the x-axis. If r is a polynomial or rational function of sine theta, then the graph will be symmetric about the line theta equals plus or minus a half pi. In other words, about the y-axis. So let's try and use that policy to try and draw a, some more polar graphs. So the first one, we've got to sketch the curve r equals 1 plus sine 2 theta. And we've got to find a Cartesian equation for this curve. So the first observation is that for r equals 1 plus sine 2 theta, the biggest possible value we can get for r is going to be 2. And that is going to occur either when theta is pi by 4 or when theta is 5 pi by 4. So that tells me that my graph is going to be completely within the circle r equals 2 and that it actually hits the circle r equals 2 when theta equals pi by 4 and theta equals 5 pi by 4. The minimum value of r is 0 and that happens when theta is 3 pi by 4 or 7 pi by 4. How do I know that's the minimum value of r? Well, I know that sine 2 theta lies between minus 1 and 1. So the smallest possible value I can have for r is 1 plus minus 1. So the minimum possible value of r is 0. 
If I have 1 plus sine 2 theta equals 0, then I've got sine 2 theta equals minus 1. That means that 2 theta must be either um, 3 pi by 2 or 7 pi by 2. In other words, theta is going to be 3 pi by 4 or 7 pi by 4. The fact that r equals 0 when theta equals 3 pi by 4 or 7 pi by 4 tells me that the lines theta equals 3 pi by 4 and theta equals 7 pi by 4 are tangential to the curve at the pole. So we need to put those in. So there are my two lines there going out. Theta equals 0 gives me r equals 1. Theta equals pi by 2 gives me r equals 1. Theta equals pi gives me r equals 1. And theta equals 3 pi by 2 gives me r equals 1. Now finally, I need to just have a think about the symmetry conditions. Now in this case here, because I've got r equals 1 plus sine 2 theta, and the only way I can rewrite that is as r equals 1 plus 2 sine theta cos theta. And that cannot be written as either a polynomial or rational function of either sine theta or cos theta. Neither of the coordinate axes, in other words, the x-axis isn't a line of symmetry and the y-axis isn't a line of symmetry in this case. So now what I've got to try and do is I'm going to try and join the points remembering that the two dotted lines that I've got have got to be tangents to the curve at the pole. And if I try and achieve that, the sort of graph that I'm coming out with is that. Now the GeoGebra app gives us a, a nice um, output for this curve r equals 1 plus sine 2 theta. But we now need just to find its Cartesian equation. So we've got r equals 1 plus sine 2 theta, which can be rewritten as r equals 1 plus 2 sine theta cos theta. Now we need to remember we've got these three useful little relationships, x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta, and r equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. So sine theta is y divided by r, and cos theta is x divided by r. So I've got r equals 1 plus 2 lots of y divided by r times by x divided by r. In other words, I've got r is equal to 1 plus 2xy divided by r squared, or r cubed equals r squared plus 2xy. We know that r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So we've got x squared plus y squared to the 3 upon 2 is equal to x squared plus y squared plus 2xy. In other words, we've got x squared plus y squared to the 3 upon 2 is x plus y squared, or x squared plus y squared cubed is x plus y to the power 4. Moving on to another example, we want to sketch the curve of r equals 4 cos squared theta minus 1 and find a Cartesian equation for this curve. So, biggest possible value I can have for cos squared theta is 1 and that is going to give me, I'm going to obtain therefore a maximum possible value for r as being 4 take away 1. In other words, the maximum possible value is going to be 3. And that's going to be achievable when either cos theta is plus 1 or cos theta equals minus 1. In other words, when theta is either naught or pi. Now the minimum possible value of 4 cos squared theta take away 1 is going to be minus 1, which will occur when cos theta is 0. 
Now, that certainly implies that there are some values of theta for which r does not exist because we can't have a minimum value of r of minus 1. So we certainly know that r is equal to naught sometimes. Now r is going to equal naught when 4 cos squared theta is 1. In other words, when cos squared theta is a quarter. In other words, when cos theta is plus or minus a half. So we've got r equals naught when theta is pi by 3, 2 pi by 3, 4 pi by 3, or 5 pi by 3. Which means that we have got rays of theta equals pi by 3, theta equals 2 pi by 3, theta equals 4 pi by 3, and theta equals 5 pi by 3 as tangents to the curve at the pole. When theta equals 0, we've got r equals 3. When theta equals pi by 2, r is minus 1. So there is no value of r. There's no graph at theta equals pi by 2. When theta equals pi, r is 3. When theta equals 3 pi by 2, we've got r equals minus 1. So again, we've got no graph at r at theta equals 3 pi by 2. So what that's telling me is that there are regions between pi by 3 and 2 pi by 3 where the graph doesn't exist. And there's also a region between theta equals 4 pi by 3 and 5 pi by 3 where the graph doesn't exist. Thinking in terms of the symmetry, I've got r is 4 cos squared theta minus 1. And that can also be written as being 3 minus 4 sine squared theta, because I know that cos squared theta is the same thing as 1 minus sine squared theta. So the formula for R can be written as a polynomial function of sine theta, or as a polynomial function of cos theta. So both the coordinate axes are going to be lines of symmetry. So putting all of this together, I'm ending up with a graph that looks something like that as my freehand graph. And moving on, the GeoGebra app gives me a rather neater version of that, a rather more tidy version of that. Finding the Cartesian equation now, again, if I've got r equals 4 times cos squared theta take away 1, then I can say that cos theta is x divided by r. So I've got r equals 4 times x over r squared take away 1. In other words, r equals 4 x squared over r squared take away 1. Or r cubed equals 4 x squared minus r squared. We know that r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So I've got x squared plus y squared to the 3 upon 2 is 4 x squared take away x squared plus y squared. So we've got x squared plus y squared to the 3 upon 2 is equal to 3x squared minus y squared. Or x squared plus y squared cubed is 3x squared minus y squared squared. Our next example, we've been given the polar graphs. We've got the graphs of r equals 2 cos squared theta and r equals 1 plus cos theta. We've got to find the points of intersection of these curves. Now, if we go through the obvious process of solving the simultaneous equations, r equals 1 plus cos theta and r equals 2 cos squared theta, then we would have, eliminating r, we've got 2 cos squared theta equals 1 plus cos theta. In other words, 2 cos squared theta minus cos theta minus 1 equals 0. And solving that as a quadratic equation in cos theta gives me cos theta equals 1 or cos theta equals minus a half. So I've got theta equals 0, theta equals 2 pi by 3 or theta equals 4 pi by 3. 
So I've got when theta equals naught, we can check from either of the two equations that r is equal to 2. When theta equals 2 pi by 3, either of the equations gives me r equals a half. Similarly, when theta equals 4 pi by 3, either of the two equations gives me r equals a half. Now, that suggests then that the points of intersection are the points whose polar coordinates are 2 naught, a half 2 pi by 3, or a half 4 pi by 3. However, if you look carefully at the graph, we can see that we have lost a point of intersection. Both the curves go through the pole. And we need to make sure that we realize that and add in on our list of the points of intersection that the pole is also a point of intersection. So when we're trying to determine the points of intersection of two polar gra graphs, we need to solve the equation from r1 equals f of theta and r2 equals g of theta by solving f of theta equals g of theta, as we've done here, but we must also just give consideration to whether the pole is a solution or a point of intersection as well. So, to emphasize that again, if we're solving, if we're finding the points of intersection of the curves r equals f of theta and r equals g of theta, we solve the equation f of theta equals g of theta will give us all of the points of intersection other than the pole. You must then also check whether both the curves pass through the pole. If they do, then you must also list the pole as being a point of intersection of the two curves. And that ends our introduction, rather lengthy introduction, to polar coordinates.